Hello everyone, this is Bob Brown with Community Coronavirus Update number 109. And we'll talk about explaining the pandemic versus end endemic debate with rattlesnakes, uh, how many really died from COVID, and uh, some ideas on making your own choices. Uh, so I grew up in western Nebraska where rattlesnakes are endemic. And so what does endemic mean? Well, there's just rattlesnakes up in the bluffs. And uh, one of my jobs when I used to get out of school uh, for the year and start working on the farm in the spring was uh, to drive the fence line up in the pasture and fix fences where you had to be careful about where the rattlesnakes were because there were rattlesnakes up there. Uh, it's even an issue for golfing. So if you're at uh, hole number one in Sydney teeing off, well, there might be a sign saying beware of rattlesnakes. And that's uh, common for western Nebraska golf courses because if you're up in the bluffs, well, there's rattlesnakes up there. And you're going to act accordingly. If you hit off to the right here, well, I wouldn't be so worried, but if you hit off to the left, eh, you'd be a little careful about how much you really want to search for your goal, golf ball over there because they may be rattlesnakes up there. Uh, but that's just an endemic and of course we'd still play golf out in western Nebraska despite the rattlesnakes because we know how to live with them. Uh, but what's epidemic versus pandemic mean? Well endemic that's the typical caution you'd use. Epidemic, uh, the way to describe an epidemic is it's a localized increase. So two rattlesnake dens off a of hole number one. I'll be a little careful now, more careful now in hole number one. Maybe I'm not going to be not only careful over here, but over here too, but I'm still going to go golfing. Pandemic would mean the rattlesnake population exploded and they're on every hole of the Sydney golf course. Well, you're probably going to act a little differently golfing. Some people might not golf until those until the rattlesnake population dies down and they can, you know, kill them back or whatever they're going to do. Uh, so how might you act? Well, like masks. So for example, if uh, it's a typical endemic phase, I might golf with regular golf shoes. If there's a few more uh, and I want to actually look for my ball, maybe I'd rather use hiking boots for golfing that day. But if we're pandemic and there's there's rattlesnakes everywhere and I still want to golf, I'm probably going to want to wear boots because, you know, this is going to protect the rattlesnake bite the ankle, but a rattlesnake might bite higher. I want boots or maybe even snake boots. My uncle had a pair of these snake boots, actually. Uh, the boots will protect you because the rattlesnakes usually don't bite that much higher and they're not going to bite through this type of material, especially if you got jeans over them there so so maybe think of that as for where we are and right now we're still we're coming off of the pandemic phase we're not quite endemic yet so what does endemic mean? Well, endemic threshold, uh, most it's not a black or white definition. So there's no magic uh, sign that's going to say now we're pandemic and now we're endemic. Uh, most people are saying, well, maybe we should use a comparability to a typical influenza year. And that's about 30,000 deaths per year. Well, where are we right now? Well, the Johns Hopkins website, if you look over there, we had 15,000 deaths just last week. So we have more deaths from COVID in two weeks than we do in a typical flu year. So we're not in the endemic phase yet. Now we could be heading that that way in the next month or two, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, so how do we decide this? Well, for example, uh, if you look at uh, one way that, that the that we've tracked this for, for decades is, is something called an excess mortality. And so we have mortality statistics going back decades. You'll see that every year there's an increase in the winter and part of this is, is influenza. So influenza tends to be endemic. There may be a bad year. So here's a bad year, influenza year. See these couple blips over here. Here's of course COVID, which is obviously no comparison influenza. So when the influenza death excess gets down to about this range, then I think we can comfortably say we're quote endemic. Uh, and you can look at this not only on the United States population, but you can go to the tog toggle and see Nebraska as well. You may have seen this uh, this uh, article that said U.S. suffered more than a million excess deaths during pandemic. Well, wait a second. Didn't the Johns Hopkins site just say 940,000? Well, that's recorded deaths, but that's actually an, uh, typically an underestimate. You really need to look at excess deaths is where you get sort of the true answer for this. Uh, and you'll also notice that there's a little discrepancy here in Nebraska. So if you go to our D Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services slot, uh, dashboard, it'll say there's only 3,210 deaths. If you go to the CDC uh, death rate, they're going to say 3,901 deaths. Uh, why is that off by about 700? Well, it's because our state is actually using a different classification than the CDC is using. Both of those numbers are wrong, by the way. However, this one, the 3,901, is closer to, to correct. Both of them, though, however, are underestimates. So how do we decide uh, at the at the end of a pandemic how many people died? Well, we go back to that excess mortality slide. And the, what you see is that yellow line. That is the typical number of deaths you would expect. Red is when there's a more than you would have expected. Something's a little up here. And of course, all those plus signs mean you've got week after week of increasing deaths. And you can look at the United States version. You can toggle down to the Nebraska version. You can literally download that data yourself. So you can click over here, pull up a cross tab, and actually pull down the spreadsheet and look at that. And you'll see there's a little more space here. This because the numbers are lower, so the, statistics, the confidence interval is a little wider. Uh, and again, you may have a week now and then where there's excess deaths. That's, a, that's just a fluke if there's only one. But when you have plus sign after plus sign, these are lots of excess deaths, and these are true excess deaths. So if you download the data, 
uh, which which we did, uh, you can actually calculate the, the likely number of deaths actually in Nebraska. This is important because the average expected count, that includes the number of people who are, quote, going to die anyway. So you hear these people say, well, some of those COVID deaths don't really count because those people are going to, quote, die anyway. Well, this would actually account for the people who are going to, quote, die anyway. But it also account for the people who are missed. There are COVID deaths that didn't get recorded because sometimes, for example, we have COVID mortality that happens weeks later from heart attacks, to strokes, and, and pulmonary emboli that might not get coded as a COVID death. There's also collateral damage. So just like in a war, civilians die. Sometimes people die of other stuff beyond COVID when we overwhelm our hospitals, which we've done twice already. So when hospitals are well, mortality goes up for everything else, heart attacks, strokes, you name it. So that's the true cost of the pandemic is this excess mortality. And 3,989 are getting close to 4,000, and it's probably a little over 4,000. Uh, because on all of the deaths are in yet. So DHHS dashboard says 3,210, CDC says 3,901, Nebraska excess deaths at this point are 3,989. It's probably just a little bit higher than that, and that's probably the true number for Nebraska. And when you look at that, you'll see this little drop off, and that's just because it takes a while for all those death certificates to make it in and get tabulated correctly. So we're probably missing a few hundred that'll get added, and we'll find that out. And so unfortunately, you can't get the true number till the pandemic's over, which we don't know if it's over yet. We'll find out. Uh, hopefully it's getting close to over. We'll see what happens. So here's the in Lincoln, our hospitalization rates. You'll see that they've dropped dramatically in the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, down by two thirds. However, we're not down back to last summer yet. Hopefully we'll continue that trend. Uh, we can look to the east. So uh, our wave started, Omicron wave started in New Jersey and New York. Their numbers look to still be dropping. The question is, will they keep dropping down to this baseline or will we establish a new, unfortunately, higher normal that would be worse than a flu year still, unfortunately? We don't know that yet. We'll see in a few more weeks. So I would not say that we're in an endemic yet. We're still pandemic, but we could be heading toward an endemic. It's going to take another few weeks before we know that. Um, here are our actual rates of cases. Well, this is uh, not always accurate, unfortunately, because a lot of cases don't get reported. Uh, some people are doing home tests. Uh, however, still, at least you can see this, the trend is down dramatically, which is giving us a little more comfort and making us a lot more optimistic, of course. We have a couple of ways to actually verify this independently. One is Lincoln Public Schools does uh, some really good contact tracing. Uh, we were at 1,200 positives uh, five weeks ago. We're down to 152 was the last complete week. We'll see how we end this week. So down you know, almost 90%. That's a good sign. Uh, UNL does uh, some active uh, testing of its student population. Their positivity rate's down to 2%, which is also a good sign. Uh, I have a friend who runs an urgent care, and he, they out of 120 viral panels last week, they actually had zero COVID cases and, and zero influenza, by the way, too. And then Midwest region, again, the numbers are lower. Uh, we'd like them to get lower yet, but, uh, but again, some signs that things at least are tracking, uh, are trending in a good uh, direction here in Nebraska. Uh, however, keep in mind though, uh, and our kids are not out of the woods yet, so you still should vaccinate your children. Uh, the thankfully, you know, we're not seeing 100,000 dead children, but we're getting eight, we're at 818 as of end of January. Uh, this is compared. This is the COVID deaths for children compared to typical the last uh, decades worth of uh, stacked flu years seasons. One flu season followed by a second because we've crossed two years now with this pandemic. Still about three to four, probably you know, three-ish times worse than influenza, but not as bad as adults, thankfully. The answer, of course, is vaccinate your kids. Uh, the peak age of, of uh, MI, multi-inflammatory syndrome in children is between the ages of 5 and 11. That's our big hole in vaccination. I think we've had a really good uptake at our school vaccination sites, but we need to get a lot more kids vaccinated. Um, the, the vaccine has been highly effective preventing that, so please, if you're still on the fence, get your kid vaccinated. So what should you do? So numbers are going uh, in a great direction, so that should make a lot of us happier. Uh, but now we're sort of an individualist decision-making process, and uh, that's kind of hard to figure out. There's a good article by uh, Bob Wachter, who's a, a physician who's well uh, recognized across the country. He kind of walked through in this perspective in the Washington Post what he would do as a 64-year-old vax doctor and, and how he would calculate his own risks. And this is kind of how I've done thing too. I'm a 52-year-old vax doctor. For me, I'm at the point now where I'm acting. I don't wear masks everywhere anymore because I'm thinking right now this is kind of more like a, like a typical flu year for me. So what should you do? Well, if you're up to date vaccinated, and that's three shots, not two, it's like a typical flu season for you. If you're un and under vaccinated, well, you know, if you got Omicron, you're you're probably good for three to six months, but I don't know how much longer. Uh, I think it's still worth you getting that vaccination. And if you're immunocompromised, well, you got to go with that layered approach, which we'll talk about in just a minute. You know, again, we're seeing that there's a big difference between no vaccinated versus two shots versus three shots. So that is the safest. And if you're at that three shot level, I think you can act like a typical flu season at this year. Two shots, it's helpful, but it's not good enough yet. So get that third if you haven't. Uh, I think that would put you a lot safer. 
So if you're immunocompromised, what do you do? Well, the first thing is whoever, if you're immunocompromised, you should have a physician who's treating you for that condition is, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or chronic myelogenous leukemia, go talk to your doctor because you may be uh, el uh, uh, eligible for a fourth shot or an antibody infusion called FTV shield, which would give you some protection for the next oh, six months or so, probably. You should talk to that doctor about oral medications that, that should you get a breakthrough infection, what should you do? Um, so an oral medicine like Paxlovid, uh, you need to have that within a certain time frame. So make sure you talk through that with them about what you're going to take. And consider getting a good mask like a KF94, KN95, uh, or an N95, uh, depending on where you are and who you're around. And remember, your dro risk drops with the COVID rates around you. Uh, so the good news is uh, I've put a link to this website. You can actually see where the availability of these things are. So let's say, you know, Dr. Eric Avery takes care of your chronic myelogenous leukemia. Well, he's got Evusheld at his office and he can get it to you. And there's even the availability, how many doses are available at his office versus all the other places. So if it's the Arthritis Center in Nebraska that takes care of your rheumatoid arthritis, you can go there. Uh, if it's Cancer Centers of Bracto, let's say you see Nate Green, you can go there. Uh, so you can figure out where you can get the Evu should, should you need it. And also Paxlovid is available at the pharmacy, so you've got another option there. So talk through that with your doctor who takes care of your chronic condition so that you're prepared should you have a breakthrough. And then I think you can get to more of a normal life as well. Uh, however, I think you still need to consider being a little careful if you've got, uh, if you're immunocompromised, you may want to have a good mask and by, and I would say, you know, kind of like the snake boots, uh, get a good decent mask, not just this cloth mask for walking around and if you're in a high risk area where there may be uh, unvaccinated and infected people. Uh, so hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, again, this is what I do for my day job, so you can verify who I am and what I do. But disclaimer, these are my opinions uh, and not necessarily those who I work with.